everyone. Uh, as Phil mentioned, my name is uh, Basma Hajir. I'm uh, joining from the UK. Uh, I think Phil put a very clear and interesting overview of the field of peace education and the dilemmas and the complexities that lie at the core of the field. What I would like to talk about today is the peace education in formal schools. Uh, Phil has just written his little something. Thank you for the teamwork. We pull it together and we make it work. Thank you so much. <laughs> you, can, you can hear me, Phil? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So uh, I had just started. I was saying thank you so much, Phil. You put a, a very clear overview of the field of peace education and you capture the complexities that lie at the core of the field. In my part, I would like to talk about peace education in formal schools. And I would like to talk about a small scale project that I conducted in collaboration with uh, International Alert. International Alert is a peace building organization that's based in London and they operate uh, peace building programs around the world. Uh, the overview of the project is that in 2018, International Alert conducted a peace perceptions poll where more than 110 participants around the world, they contributed to this poll and they were asked about their perceptions of peace and conflict and what governments can do in order to achieve sustainable uh, peace. One interesting finding was an almost universal support for teaching peace in schools. Following up on this result, we started this small scale project really to try to understand what does teaching peace in schools mean? and how do we conceptualize peace education in formal schools and what practical implications or possibly policy-oriented recommendations that we can offer. And in order to answer these questions, we first started with conducting a comprehensive literature review of both theory and praxis of peace education and studying extensively different case studies of peace education specifically in formal schools. We came up with a set of important themes and questions, and then we further interrogated them by interviewing uh, leading scholars and practitioners in the field of peace education. Uh, in this session, I will provide, unfortunately, uh, we don't have time to cover everything in relation to this project, but I chose a specific set of findings that I would like to, to introduce to you. And I need to highlight also that this project is a still work in progress. So I would really appreciate any feedback. I can still integrate your feedback and insights in the project before we get it published. Uh, and I can start by saying that when we were analyzing the results and preparing to present our findings, one important issue that we struggled with is really, as, as Phil mentioned, the wide diversity and multitude of conceptualizations of peace education. And we found this a problem, and we found that scholars in peace education have recurrently highlighted this diversity of conceptualization as one of the most severe undermining factors of peace education, both as a scholarly and a pedagogic field. So we, we realized early on that one first step we should do is to establish some sort of conceptual clarity. When we say peace education in formal schools, what does this mean? We ended up formulating a conceptualization of that based on the analysis of the literature review and based on the findings that we got and we received the input we received from participants. I'm going to share my screen now and show the uh, slides with the conceptualization. And while doing this, I would like to maintain that this is certainly not a definitive conceptualization. There is always a need for context sensitivity, there is always a need for attending the, to the needs of the learners and amending accordingly. Uh, host disabled attendee screen sharing. Okay. Is this something can be fixed quickly? Yeah, yeah, you should be able to share. That's fine. Uh, okay, I'm trying again. Yes. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. So, we started by setting this conceptualization uh, that peace education in formal schools is about producing caring, compassionate, critical, and civically engaged citizens who can advocate cultures of peace. And it aspires to develop individuals who are 
healthy members of a healthy, peaceful school environment. They enjoy personal, social, emotional, and interpersonal skills. They are capable of empathy and solidarity, both within and across borders. And they're able to deconstruct foundations of violence, like poverty, inequality, gender disparity, etc. Now, when we look at this conceptual, uh, conceptualization, we see the multidimensional nature of it. We see that it actually includes psycholo psychologized or individual components and at the same time, sociopolitical dimensions. And it also includes some pedagogical implications. And this means that moving forward towards somehow operationalizing this conceptualization, we need to take account of three important elements. First, we need to look at the form of education that's happening inside the classroom. And second, we need to look at the wider school environment and school culture. And we need to take account of promoting critical awareness of issues that threaten social justice. Now let's talk about each one of those. When we talk about form of education inside the classroom, we're really mainly talking about starting with interrogating what is happening in the classroom as an important starting point towards promoting wider democratic structures in the school. We propose these main questions that we can ask ourselves, like to what extent do schools offer inclusive and safe spaces for meaningful participation, dialogue, two-way communication? To what extent do schools encourage students to cooperate together? And in what ways are we promoting students' critical thinking and analytic tools. Now, when we move outward towards the school culture, we found that there is a great need for investing in establishing and promoting the school ethos that align with the main values and principles of peace. One very important uh, work in the field that we, we greatly drew on is a book published in 2017 by Hilary Kriman and Terence Bevington. It's called Positive Peace in Schools. Uh, interesting about this project is that Kremen and Puffington drew on Johan Galton concepts that Phil uh, earlier on uh, mentioned, positive and negative peace. And they try to unpack the structural and cultural violence that exists within schools and how can we move towards achieving peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building inside schools. Now, uh, I can briefly mention, because I, I think most of you guys might be aware of what these concepts mean, but within schools, uh, peacekeeping, we mean like how to ensure that there is no physical violence in schools, but in a way that does not cause harm to, uh, to students, as in like, uh, and does not prevent their thriving or affect their mental health. So how to do things that makes us avoid uh, physical violence. Now, peacemaking is about when actually the problem occurs, when conflict happens, how to solve this conflict using more child-centered methods rather than punitive or authoritarian methods. Peace building is the more proactive aspect, and it's about how to work towards promoting a more inclusive and cohesive uh, school culture. Uh, of course, everything we talked about in terms of a form of education inside the classroom and the school culture requires capacity building and teacher training. So there is a great need for developing effective systems for professional support that promote teachers. So teachers need to be conflict literate in, in a sense that they have to internalize the values of peace and engage in it pedagogically with others. Uh, they need to be able to identify structural and cultural violence that uh, happens within the borders of school and do something in order to counteract some of that. And of course, we need th there's a need to develop their reflexive capacities as and to reflect on their practices inside the classroom and the kind of activities that they, they're leading. Now, when we talk about the broader social and political purpose of peace education, uh, this is, I think, the most contentious part, and it is definitely neither linear nor straightforward, and there is no one way to do that. Uh, if we, for example, choose to develop content that engages students with these matters, we might come to a point where we have to change the whole formal schooling system, which we realize that this is, might be a far-fetched idealistic endeavor. And we found that a more realistic task is to try to 
find the space in the system where we can do some complementary work. Four important points emerged in, in, in re with regard to this uh, element is, number one, the importance of education policies and legislation. Uh, we found that when there is education policies and uh, legislation, they usually lead for vast implementation uh, of the reforms and they usually garner the support of civil society, uh, which also advance the uh, implementation of the reforms. Education policies are important, but sometimes they can be risky in a sense that sometimes they might allow some extreme political agendas to find their way to formal school systems. And it is here exactly where there is a need for some formal non-formal collaboration because the non-formal non sectors might observe what's happening in the schools, monitor and make sure that the content is not too politicized or it's not uh, contribute to extreme political agendas, for example. And of course, there is always like uh, the benefit of uh, benefiting from the resources and capacities that the non-formal sector bring inside uh, the schools. Uh, we found that the most successful peace education programs in formal schools are the one where there is formal non-formal collaboration and where they have a wider community reach. So community-based approaches are found to be highly successful and the last point I'm going to talk about is, it is actually a point that has brought up to our attention by COVID-19, is the importance of informal spaces and the importance like uh, informal spaces like online spaces. So uh, I think the current crisis uh, have enabled us to see that with all the amount of homeschooling that's happening, uh, that students or formal schools can think of how, utilize, how to utilize these spaces post COVID-19 in order to do some of the stuff that complement what's happening in the classroom. Uh, what's currently missing, I think, are the, definitely the resources, the input, the curriculum, which we can pot potentially start thinking about how to develop. Uh, I'm going to stop here. This is a figure that summarizes almost what I said. It's like peace education in formal schools. It's really multidimensional. It talks, it's about inside the classroom, the school environment, the wider community. There is a need for policy, for capacity building. Uh, yeah, I will stop here and I will hand over to you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fasma. So if you can stop sharing your screen. Uh, yes, I'm trying. Sure. Done. Thank you. So, so okay, thank you so much, Basma, for what was a wonderful ex um, presentation. And you said kind of a sm in the wording that you use, you said a small scale project. It sounds a massive undertaking and you've, you've laid out some wonderful things for us as, as budding peace educators, you know, interested and involved in this field to think about. Some of the things that I love this idea of framing it around um, education should be about, or peace education should be about care, about helping to develop, promote, facilitate, caring, compassionate, critical and civically engaged human beings. Sounds like a pretty good way of thinking about the overall purpose of education to me, not just peace education. You know, how do we bring about people that are critically mind thinking, but have caring hearts, but also at the same time can do something about the critical thinking and the caring hearts to bring about change through civic engagement. So I think that was a wonderful kind of presentation. And again, thank you for touching on this ongoing challenge around the disconnect between what happens in the classroom and what happens in the community. You know, we really need to kind of bridge this gap. There's some amazing examples happening, but not enough of them. So thank you so much, uh, Basma. So that was, that was framed as giving an overall kind of global towards a global perspective. Now what we're going to do is move on to um, our next speaker and I'm going to share the screen here with everyone. Um, and our next speaker we're delighted to have. Um, wonderful scholar and also I just want to say as well Mark, can I just do a bit of a shout out as well, a very humble human being as well, which we really need more of. It's sometimes in this peace and conflict world. Basma is also, um, and I'm sure all of us are here as well, but speaking to Amar, such a well-traveled look at his bio. I'm not going to read it out, but very, very impressive, but such a humble human, human being as well. So, so um, I'm going to move this out the way, and Amar is going to speak about peace education, a perspective from the Middle East. 
So please, uh, when you're when you're free, Amma, please please take it away. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Phil. I hope you guys can hear me. Yes. Okay. Great. Great. Um, really, thank you, Phil. And I have to say, from all every activity of this type. It is great to meet the wonderful people and uh, Phil, I really am very, very happy to meet you and to get to know you. And welcome to everyone and um, uh, I will try to stick with the nine minutes, which is really a challenge. Um, uh, and I feel that actually what uh, Basma did was great uh, because she laid a very good foundation for understanding the key components of uh, what, is, what goes into what we call peace education and how it may work. And as she was talking, I was wondering, so, okay, so how will this fit with what I will be talking about? And I thought, yeah, actually it's gonna work very well because uh, she gave us, uh, let's call it the prescription for how things should work if we are doing peace education. And what I will be doing is to say, to address what in issues in the Middle East. We have so many issues there. So I would like to highlight not necessarily the, how peace education works. I think Basma did a great job already on that. But I'll be talking about some of the, the structural issues uh, rather than more of the direct violence issues that exist in the Middle East in general and how can peace education actually tackle uh, some of those. Uh, and then of course, I will also address the COVID-19 issue that has been introduced lately. Um, I, I usually have a, a habit when I speak to a group of uh, a multicultural group like this, I always like to make sure that people understand my accent and that I am not speaking too fast. So if you just with a thumb up or, or again, shake, whatever, uh, just tell me, am I doing all right? All right. So great. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So I am going to share my screen. I hope I'll get the right one. Here we go. Um, and actually, I'm going to stop for a second and then share again uh, because I need to get the sound because I may be able to play a short video for you when I'm doing this. Okay. Share. All right. Um, you can see this, right? Can you see my screen? Okay. Oops. My apology, I will get things in the right shape in a minute. Okay. All right, so we are with the Global Cyber Peace Conference and I'll be talking about the promise of peace education in the Middle East. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, following on what Basma did, uh, I will not go much into what go, how we do peace education, but I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we hope peace education can play a role in. And I'll be talking about two types of di uh, di conflict dynamics that we are dealing with. One is what I call constant uh, conflict dynamics and the other one is our shifting dynamics. The uh, constant uh, means a more long term issues that have existed and persisted for centuries maybe in the Middle East and uh, the shifting ones are more emerging issues. Um, and of course, allow me that my uh, presentation will be fairly quick. Uh, I cannot go in details in each item. However, uh, I made sure that the uh, PowerPoint presentation has more items than one, what I will be talking about here, uh, trusting that Phil and team will be able to share with all of you. In terms of what I call constant conflict inducing dynamics that exist in the Middle East. Uh, and again, mainly it will be, uh, it will be about structure issues and um, culture issues. Uh, identity formation, I think is something that we, we continue to struggle with in the Middle East, especially how do we balance between uh, our religious identity and modern identity and a third one, which is a traditional one. And how can we make all of them work together to deal with issues uh, of today. Uh, another issue, of course, we deal with is as a result almost of the identity formation issue is the violent extremism that is committed wrongly, and I have to understand underline wrongly million times in the name of Islam. Uh, the, the question of youth, youth bulge, and, uh, and of course, this is causing us a lot of challenges with issues of unemployment and violence and and, um, and drug, uh, drugs and, um, and illegal migration, you name it. 
Gender injustice is one of the definitely persisting issues that we are struggling with. And every day we are realizing more challenges when it comes to issues of gender injustices. We had a situation happen in Egypt um, uh, and, and Canada, actually. A young uh, woman who uh, actually identified herself eventually as an, a, a member of the LGBTQ community in Egypt. And as you can imagine, this is an issue that is not favorable for many people in that country. Unfortunately, she was harassed and abused and put in prison. And she had to finally go to Canada. And she lives there for the last two, three years. She was very depressed from everything that happened to her and what she saw in prison. And then her mother died when she was far away and couldn't go back to Egypt. She committed suicide a week ago. This raised a lot of questions uh, uh, and debates, especially, especially about young people, about our understanding of issues of gender and sexual orientation. And I think it's a good example of what we are struggling with when it comes to some gender issues. Uh, foreign interference, uh, whether we like it or not, uh, this is a serious issue. I work a lot, especially in Iraq. And every time I work with Iraqi colleagues to, to, to uh, imagine peace education, to imagine peace building, they always say, well, great stuff, we like it, but what can we do when foreign interference is, is uh, uh, motivated mainly by uh, resources and control over resources or regional uh, uh, competition between the re regional powers? And we feel that we are helpless. And really, it's a question to be addressed. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict is something that it has to be dealt with in, in a serious manner, and it cannot be dealt with in the uh, trump Kushner way. It is not about material gain and about money, and let's give them $50 billion and do development. When you deal with values and identity issues, the first item, you cannot put money on it. Uh, just yesterday on TV, I saw here in the US that uh, there was a question about uh, those famous uh, stone, uh, uh, the Rushmore uh, famous uh, stone images of the four presidents of, uh, of the United States that are craved in a mountain in South Dakota. And uh, there was a discussion about how they will want to compensate the Native Americans who consider this place sacred. And they said that actually a court ruled that they can get uh, uh, some compensation financially or get a share from the profit of all the tourism. And they spoke to one of the leaders of the community and, and he said, no, it's not about money. It's about that this is the most sacred place. They call it the Black Hills for us. And they came and carved those stones and made those statues in our very uh, sacred place. No money you can put on this. And I want to say the issue from the Palestinian perspective, at least, and I'm sure also from the Israeli Jewish perspective, it is similar to that. It's about value. It's about who we are and identity. And then ultimately on the constant issues is the question of authoritarianism, which I think that we have not historically been able to deal with in the entire Middle East. And we continue and connect it to number five, and you realize that authoritarianism actually works very well to serve the interests uh, of foreign powers. In, in terms of the shifting conflict-inducing dynamics, those are things that are just happening. Do they come and go or more recent? One, of course, is the genera generational conflict. And, um, uh, and uh, this is increasing with, because of the increase of social media and the exposure of young people to uh, a wider world. Uh, it is putting them in contrast with the, more, oh, the older generation and more traditions that uh, persist in their uh, societies. Uh, I always say the Arab Spring is not over. And I think it's a statement of optimism. Uh, it, we may be kind of in, in a very desperate point right now, discouraging point uh, as far as where the Arab Spring has taken us, but uh, I believe it's not over and that's one of those things that I can talk longer about, but I don't have the time now. The changing notion of state sovereignty, and I think there's a lot of challenges coming from multinational um, uh, corporations, from uh, some of the non-state actors, even those who act violently, and they challenge the, the sovereignty of the state. Um, the shifting alliances and greater influence of regional powers such as Iran and Turkey. And we are seeing what's happening in Libya and what's happening in Iraq and Syria are good examples. Climate change having great effect, especially on the uh, southern border of, um, of what we call the MENA region and the Middle East uh, and the North Africa, is the area of the Sahel especially, is affected tremendously by climate change on many levels. And of course, the effect is on resources and on migration trends. 
And then the migration trends in the Middle East uh, uh, and uh, the source being a source, a destination, and the transit at the same time. Uh, the shifting regional linkages between nations and states. Uh, I think we are seeing a lot of new uh, patterns of conflict emerging, especially the one we're seeing now in the, between Egypt and Ethiopia around the, the dam um, that are, they are uh, building and they want to reserve water. Uh, and it's going to affect Egypt, and this is becoming a big uh, challenge indeed for all of us. So what do we want to do in terms of prospects of peace? Um, in addition to regional integration across nations and states, which I believe that we can be inspired by what we saw in the European Union, but we are very far away because we have not done the hard work of peace building. Peace building doesn't come by chance, by accident. And to have a model uh, experiment such as the, the, the European Union, you will have to work deliberately in that direction. And we have to have political and people will to go in that direction. We are not there yet. Control of army trades. And that's an issue, I, I mean, given that this session is about Euro Europe, Africa, and Middle East, control of army trade, I think, is a responsibility of the people. And that goes back to one of the elements that Basma spoke about. If the people of the country that produce arms do not put pressure on their own government to stop sending arms to the Middle East, then we would be continuously going into vicious cycles of direct violence with negative consequences to everyone, not only to people from the Middle East. And we have seen this with all the terrorism that happens also back. It goes back to Europe and goes back to countries that keep exporting arms to our part of the world. There is an ethical and human responsibility on the people to put pressure on their governments, to stop selling arms and the companies that keep producing arms. Uh, just to give you a quick example, I get a little bit passionate about this one because it really, this is a space where we can work together. Some of the countries that we consider to be among the most peace loving, and they are indeed, they produce some of the most like uh, lethal weapons used in the Middle East. Among them, for example, the uh, shoulder-held uh, 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 rocket that uh, people put on their shoulder and they shoot with it, and of course, it's very, with huge amount of damage and killing of people. The one country that produces the most of this is, and, and exports as well, Sweden. And specifically, the, the company that makes it is the car company. We know, we know it more as a car company, SAP, S-A-A-P is the one, one company that makes such rockets. And they are sold in the Middle East. They, get, they find their way to terrorist groups who, of course, will use them and uh, uh, indiscriminately, unfortunately. I, I say that we have to do something about this together as people. And then promotion of successful de-radicalization models. Again, I'll talk to Phil about this. We can talk about a whole other presentation about it. Finally, on the point that Basma was making, we need multidisciplinary education for nonviolence and peaceful approaches to conflicts. And this will, will, will embrace all the points that she mentioned about, uh, uh, and some of the, the very good points I saw in the chat about how peace education should be formulated. Uh, I believe that this is a must for true transformation on the long term of the people in that part of the world. In the middle of this, we enter into COVID-19. And here comes a virus that is not only about health issues, but it also reveals the ideological, political, cultural, and justice challenges. I will uh, skip over the ideological, political, and cultural issues for, for the sake of time, uh, but I left the slides for those who are interested. Um, and I wanna talk more about the, so the social justice issue. What we are seeing is that that virus and, uh, and how fatal it is actually targets certain people. We know that the, the rates of death among elderly people are high, but also among uh, uh, marginalized groups who have been disenfranchised historically. We see this with African Americans we, and Hispanics in the United States. And I worry that if the, 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 the rate of infection and mortality starts to increase in the global south, including in the Middle East, then definitely who will be affected? It's not going to be the, the affluent and the rich and those who have access to health care. It's going to be the poor. It's going to be the women, the children, and specifically people who are disadvantaged economically. 
uh, in those societies. And usually, unfortunately, the, the disadvantage economically is associated with some identity issues, from an, being from an ethnic group, being from a certain religious group, and so on. And I worry that this will be the challenge that we'll face. The question of social justice and how it relates to COVID-19 uh, has been, of course, uh, signaled, uh, especially in the US, and the coincidence that of a couple of uh, uh, situations that happened in the US in the last few weeks, which I am sure that you all are familiar with, at least one of the two pictures in front of you, the one uh, from uh, uh, the, the police officers who put his uh, uh, knee on the neck of this guy until he died, George Floyd. But then there was also that other story of uh, that person, her name is Amy Cooper, which highlighted some deeper cultural violence and structural violence that is ingrained in, in inside people, inside an individual. I don't have the time to go through it, but if you just look up Amy Cooper, see that video and what happened between her and an African-American man, I think you'll be shocked at the level of how people even will manipulate and use uh, structural violence to, to advance what they want, even at the expense of what can happen to somebody. Uh, those issues are not only in the U.S., it's, and I'm just uh, illustrating this as an example, but the issues of uh, social injustice and how they relate to COVID will, be, uh, will happen everywhere. One of those, uh, uh, I don't know if you've seen this image before of this cartoon, uh, uh, but here in this one, it's in heaven, and George Floyd is sitting with those two people, and he's saying, what happened to you? Why are you here? The elephant says, my mama trusted humans. And the young woman is saying, I freed some birds. The elephant is actually about a story happened in India a few weeks ago, when this elephant, mama elephant, went to a village and some kids wanted to play a game. They, she was hungry, they gave her coconut and they put some fireworks inside the coconut. When she ate it, the firework exploded in her mouth. She suffered and she kept walking around wandering in the village for somebody to help her. Nobody helped her until she died and the baby died. This one girl is sitting on the swing. She's from Pakistan. A, a, a young girl, maid, servant, works in the house of an affluent family, which is something we see across the whole Middle East. We all have seen that the young little women, girls especially, who come and work in, in, in homes of the rich affluent people. This girl, nine, 10 years old, went to work in the home of one of the affluent people. They have two parrots they, they, in, in a cage. She's responsible among, uh, in addition to, to cleaning and feeding and being abused, she's also responsible to feed the birds. When she went to feed them one time, apparently the birds flew out. When the master and his wife came and they saw that the birds were, flew out, they were so mad because the parrots are very expensive. They kept beating this girl until they killed her. That happened about two weeks ago in Pakistan. And it happened in the Middle East everywhere, everywhere. We know those incidents in Lebanon, in Kuwait, in Egypt, in many places. This injustice that we see happening is something that uh, I cannot say it's only a Pakistani issue, American issue, or Indian. It is so much, all those issues we see in front of us, including racism against people with dark skin, exists in the Middle East. And here I will just uh, play for you a very short uh, introduction to a program to deal with issues of racism in Egypt against the refugees from Sudan. I will just stop it here for now, but it shows you that I, wanna, I wanted to make sure that nobody thinks that I'm talking about issues happening in other parts of the world. We have our share of racism and we have our share of, of um, uh, marginalizing people based on ethnic groups and so uh, ethnicity and other uh, dimension and religion. And those women refugees because of the color of skin are subject to things like this in Egypt, unfortunately. Our hope is peace education as a transformative long-term tool. And again, thank you, Basma. I think you explained everything. I can just put it in one word like this, but you've done a great job explaining it. But I add to that, and maybe related to what you said, is that in addition to peace education, we need to create space for young people's innovation. 
And I will show you quickly what, who is this young man. This is a young boy. He is finishing high school, going to college from Ethiopia. I worked in Ethiopia for two years. And his mother was um, one of the cleaning ladies in our uh, institute where I worked. And I uh, had a very good relationship with her and the other and her colleagues. And then she introduced her son, who was a brilliant young boy in school, and he's an innovator. He is brilliant with technology. And uh, he actually was working, and I was supporting him in developing um, solar-powered uh, wheelchairs for people who are handicapped and disabled uh, in Addis Ababa and beyond. And then he wrote me just about uh, 10 days ago to uh, send me this video to show me what he did to address some of the COVID-19 issues. We know that one of the main preventive uh, methods for us is to sanitize our hand and to always wash our hand. So he created this very simple in invention. Thank you. Oh. Very simple, doesn't cost anything, but definitely can save a lot of lives. If our peace education can support okay. a young man like this and make him uh, and make others like him uh, effective and uh, productive in the societies, and instead of being abused because of their social status, because of the color of his skin, then our peace education is successful. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. Thank you so much. If you could unshare your screen, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I will. And thank you so much for, um, yeah, a wonderful presentation. We've had two wonderful presentations so far. You've covered so much ground there. Ahmad. You know, um, some of the things that stood out to me is this idea of, um, you know, we need to address this intergenerational gap between young people and people that are older as well. Um, and that's something if people are interested that we'll be addressing in the session later on youth and peace. How do we go about working together to bring young people and other people together to try and uh, make progress in terms of the prospects for peace that, that has just been spoke about. And I love that, um, the young people in innovation, that is very, very true. Lots of research show young people full of creativity, full of innovation. So please join us later in the Youth and Peace one. And very interesting reflection in terms of um, the example you gave about Sweden, which is really, really interesting because people don't tend to think of that, right? We need to remember that, you know, wars might take place in a certain place, but war preparation takes place in certain places as well, which is kind of seen as more peaceful. You know, for, that's part of my work with my work work. I work for an organization called World Beyond War. That's what we do. We look at, you know, how is it that two, two trillion a year is spent on militarism? Half of that is spent by the US. How is it that the US is the biggest, bar none, institutional consumer of oil in, in the, on the planet? you know, uh, the US military. So yeah, thank you for sharing that. So with that in mind, we're going to do something really, really interesting um, to get some voices in the room. And what we thought we'd do is do a bit of a challenge. And I might be calling on people here um, and do it in terms of names. Or maybe Donna, why don't I ask you to kind of do that, to do this, to call on people. And everybody here will have a chance to say one word um, which they have in their head right now, based on the two presentations that they've heard from, from Basma and Amar. So, um, Donna, are you okay to manage this part? I can, yes, indeed. Um, so, I'm going to, I'm scrolling down through the list. I feel like uh, if you really don't want to participate, of course you don't have to, <laughs> just to emphasize that. Uh, or you can use the chat function if you prefer. How about... Um, Roshan or Roshan, would you like to share one word or a sentence about what you're thinking and feeling about now, post listening to these wonderful presentations? One word, uh, like... or, or, or sentence if you prefer. Word is quite hard. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, so I think uh, this the presentation spoke about. Uh, a lot about how uh, racism has gone to different places and uh, and the causes are not just internally but it is also the external support that has been done by other countries to induce more uh, violation so yeah uh, it's a different perspective or 
uh, got to know about this here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've seen that. Is it Joanna? Johanna? Johanna Gale, you've written Peace is Possible in the chat. Would you like to expand on that? Um, yeah, peace is very possible as long as we do our best and put our heart into it. Just like what other peace builders are doing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Makes me think of, I keep going back to in the opening ceremony about the talking about care and inner peace and it starts with you and the, your family and building out and yeah. Thank you, Johanna. Um, going scrolling up. Um, Dale, would you like to share anything, Dale? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's both inner work and outer work. Over. Yeah, fantastic. Um, looking at, uh, oh, it's so difficult. I'm just scrolling here. Um, Mark, I think Mark, you've been in the chat sometime. Hi there. Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, it was very interesting. Uh, I think the kind of micro view of, of dealing with children and then uh, Amir Davis, uh, incredible uh, view of the context. Uh, and, you know, there are unique problems in the Middle East, but many of the things he talks about are, are worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but he did give us, I mean, amazing uh, overview of the issues in the Middle East. I, amazing 10 minutes. <laughs> There's my, my, my short version, amazing 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say, you're definitely wearing the flag there for the Rotary Action Group for Peace. Go rag for peace. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> okay, next, please. Um, I'm going to do a, a teacher tour where I'm gonna ask Mark to choose someone now because this is what I do with my students. So it's not always me choosing the same people. So Mark, would you like to choose the next person we haven't heard from? Oh my God, uh, maybe <laughs> Idris, as Idris or Dries. Uh, the reason, is she still here? Yeah, it should, should be, yeah. I've just asked him to unmute, let's see. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, well then, uh, how about Walter? Sorry, yes, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, I'm coming to the group with uh, delay. I heard very much, yes, peace is possible if we put our heart. But uh, these are very nice words. And I have to tell you about my gap background. I was 40 years in the foreign service and I heard so many nice words about peace and I saw the reality surrounding us. So I would tell you, we have to make the next step. And the challenge is to translate the nice words the good feelings which are coming from our heart to action. And there I'm coming in during the whole day, I will come time and again with the incubator, Rotarians, Peace Fellows, international experts. We have all worked together, but work together to develop concrete projects. No, it's good to say uh, domestic violence is bad, but imagine, imagine if 35,000 rotary clubs around the world, together with our 1,200 peace fellows, would work together to fight domestic violence with concrete projects. This would be a real contribution to peace. So, my call is not just for action, but for real action on the ground where we can put our hands on. Thank you. 
Thank you. I, I think if you're tying them two together, Walter, it kind of brings us back to some of the things that Amara and Basma spoke about around this idea of you know, caring. The heart part is very, very important and compassion is very, very important, but it's um, necessary but not sufficient. We need to engage in action as well. So then that relates to Basma's idea of civic engagement as well. So I think you've done a great way of kind of tying them in there. So thank you. So who next on it? Or do you, do you like that? Well, like, I've just seen, well, yes, but I've just seen Sybil has written something in the chat about peace education in early childhood. And as that is also one of my, I'm going to use my bias and say, Sybil, would you like to expand on that some more? Hey, I'm unmuted and I hope you all hear me. I think it's very, we're not, we're not mere born racists and we're not born uh, warmongering. I think we are made into it. And unless we concentrate already early, fairly early on, on peace education, because we need to foster empathy in the children, empathy towards other people, empathy towards the uh, animals, towards anything which is living. And it's like this that people can actually grow up uh, being peaceful and being understanding rather than let them go loose and, and then try to change an already an established pattern. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, in the, the, the English curriculum it's a very big feature of the early childhood curriculum um, the personal social aspects um, but again talking about the challenges you had earlier about teacher capacity building and things like that it's very very important to uh, to link to that as well thank you Sybil would you like to pick the next person okay <laughs> let me go to the list uh, well where is the list Okay, um, so who hasn't spoken yet? Uh, Andreas Riemann. Yes, hi everybody, thanks. Uh, I was just thinking about um, that when I uh, listen to somebody who talks about uh, problems of the Middle East, for me it's, it's also quite, it's, uh, it's always quite shocking what's, uh, what's happening there. And at the same time, it's a, I think it's a place uh, of hope. No, it's a, it's also a, a spiritual place. And I always think about this tragedy and and also the hope and being a German and the German history. So everything is connected. And I remember a couple of years ago when I did a, a master's degree in uh, peace and reconciliation studies. Uh, I wrote an essay about peace education and. I remember this guy from the Middle East. Uh, it was a professor. I think his name was Bar On or something. Is it possible? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I really, uh, I, I don't remember many many details, but I, I remember that I, I liked it. Uh, I, I, I liked very much uh, um, reading uh, um, him, and um, I. Uh, I also uh, share what what uh, Sibylle said. No? Uh, everything is learned uh, in this life, and uh, we can we, we can unlearn things. And I think this is this is uh, what uh, what peace education is is all about. Because uh, many children come um, with many uh, with uh, much information uh, from their families, but uh, I think uh, one. Uh, one idea of peace education is uh, to to unlearn no? and, and and to learn to be humans really no? mm. yeah well so on that point so a couple of things you raised there so with regards to people that are interested in, who are writing on the subject you know of the middle east so so baron um other people you might want to check out gabriel salomon has wrote a lot about peace education particularly in the in that context but more, more broadly mm -hmm. as well and with regards to what Andreas just said around um, 
you know, yeah, learning. Um, I think that's something that's an ongoing journey for all of us, right? We're all always learning. So whether we learn the right thing or not is, is the most important thing. So we can learn, we can unlearn and we can relearn as well. So I think, yeah. uh, thank you. Thanks for showing that, Andreas. So who would you like to pick next? Um, I think it's, uh, oh, who is it? Who is it? Um, Omer Guben. Omer Guben, <laughs> please. Thank you for pronouncing my umlauts. <laughs> um, and, and thank you for picking me. I think I, I just want to recall a situation when I used to work uh, as a delegate for the Swiss Red Cross in Lebanon. Uh, working closely with the Palestinian Red Cross and the Lebanese Red Cross. And I remember there was a situation where everybody was asking, is there going to be war in Lebanon or not? And the Secretary General of Lebanon, of the Lebanese Red Cross, simply just said, no, there will not be, because the outside forces have decided not to have war. And that had quite a, a, a lasting impact on me. I think that's also a question we should ask ourselves and I agree, we should have concrete actions, but then also ask ourselves critically, what prevented us from doing so? Because I think all the things are quite obvious that we need to do that. Uh, so what, are, what, are, what prevents us from, from doing the concrete steps? The second thing in terms of children, I think, yes, we, we are not born with those kind of racism and so on, but I also think we as adults, we forget what kind of impact it has on us if we experience a conflict. I mean, each one of us, we can ask an, an experience in the childhood, which we very much vividly remember uh, till today and have an impact on our adult life. But we as adults and the decision makers are uh, forgetting that. And there's a very powerful study that was done by Save the Children where I used to work. It's called Invisible Wounds. And that was a report that really reminded me again what kind of impact war just has on children and ourselves multi multi from what we experienced in our childhood or what i experienced in my childhood so the one thing is the outside forces outside of a country another speaker mentioned that and then also remembering uh, what kind of uh, wounds we have from conflicts in our childhood in general i think that's an important thing Thank, thank you, Omar. Yeah, and so, so as you were talking, you're making me think that other speakers have kind of mentioned about it. So Omar spoke about um, Sweden, you know, in terms of their role in war preparation. And then meanwhile, in, in the when people have been feeding back, they've been speaking about the devastating fact, um, the impact of war in, in the present, as in, you know, killing lots and lots of people. And you've also just touched on this idea of post let's say post conflict post war kind of the remnants of war you know that might live on for a long long time i think you're right you know all of us will remember a certain conflict that we that we've had you know that we might have had etc so as peace builders as peace education we need to think about that as well so thank you for for bringing that up who, who would you like to um ask to speak next um I would like to choose Nela garcia if that's okay for you because you appear on my screen um, hello everyone. Uh, for the first talk, I will keep with the promote critical thinking in peace education. That impacts me a lot because uh, I have been trying to go into this field and I think it's one of the most important thing. And uh, for the second talk, I will keep the awareness of the social injustice because if we can see reality this is how we can act mm -hmm. thank you yeah great great reflections and who, who would you uh who would you uh, like to invite to speak next um maria fernandez hi maria fernanda <laughs> <laughs> hey, hello everyone uh, what I think about like uh, uh, the the conversation uh, the conversation that we had it's more about the challenge that we have as peace builders as people that is working in, in this field of peace that is not easy um, because mainly we are talking just peace builders here and we need like uh, to encourage other people to believe like in the utopia at some point of the peace 
and I think that uh, from the two conversation, I can, I can say that maybe we need like a, a piece more inter interdisciplinary, like uh, we have to start with the, with the small revolutions of changes uh, to start like uh, um, uh, seeing like the change that the society needs, but we just um, we just uh, get uh, this change when we just have these small examples of peace in the society. So um, I think that uh, peace and uh, interdisciplinary is really important, but also it is important to work in is in a small scale for 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 uh, encourage the peace in the society yeah and should i choose someone or yeah we don't have yeah, change something that if it's if it's okay if can i just offer something about what you said because i thought it was really really useful as well this idea of um you call it interdisciplinary and you know other people might think of it as multidisciplinary or you know johan galton would think about it as transdisciplinary i think it's a really interesting reflection and, and one that perhaps i can i'd notice a little bit of myself so so um I, sometimes I can be thought of like a peace builder by accident, you know, it wasn't as if I set out, you know, like 20 years ago, I will become a peace builder, you know, so I started off as a, my background originally is kind of youth work and psychotherapy. So I noticed that it's very tra I'm trained, you know, from a practice point of view in terms of developing relationships, you know, on, on an on a individual level, personal level, group level, etc. But then when I started looking at the peace and conflict world, probably about 10 years ago, I noticed that that's that's necessary. It's very, very important. And it touches on Basma's idea of this psychological approach, but it's not sufficient. You know, so that's why I went on and I did my 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 PhD and everything in the area of political science. Um, so it was I don't know. I'm not so sure of if it was as strategic as what I think back now. But in that way, we if we're wanting to address the problematic of violence, which is at the core of all of peace work, right? We cannot look at it just through one lens, you know, and I often see that many people might just stay in one discipline and that's fine. That's up to them, you know, but I think if you want to take a holistic approach, um, you know, then I would suggest perhaps looking at things and looking at training in diff through different lenses, because if you just look at it, just an educator who are not traditionally trained in, let's say, a broader kind of structural approach or not trained in a kind of psychotherapy or counselling or psychology approach, then they might be missing out on something. But it's just a personal reflection. Um, so thank you for that. So if you could invite one more and then we're going to use the last 10 minutes to kind of uh, explore a, a question. What about uh, Russian, uh, Russian rank, uh, rank, rank Homi? Russian I think went, I think. I think Russian went. Is that right? I yes, think. he did. Oh, um, so. The I saw. I don't know if he's still here. Baska, Baska yeah. Kafel had his hand raised earlier. Hmm. I don't know if he still wants to share. Maybe. Uh, yes. Yes. Or, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I actually. Uh, was very interested in the presentation that Basma made and uh, the framework that, that uh, you presented at the end that was about uh, the three dimensions like uh, wider community, school environment and classrooms. What can be done? And then especially the concept about peacekeeping, peacemaking and peace building within the school. And that was very interesting um, stuff. And I was wondering like, is this, is there an, a research already done in this area? Is this a, framework that you have developed or you have got it from someone or if anybody is working on this uh, already. So it's just a, just a query that I have. Thank you. Over to you. That's a question. Uh, yes. Thank you so much for this question. It's really important. Uh, concerning the, the figure we've developed based on the analysis of the findings of the overall project, like I mentioned, building on the literature review and building on the insights that we got from the participants. Now, when it comes to, I think you specifically asked community-based approaches, uh, I mentioned that we analyzed a set of case studies of peace education in formal schools. I can mention, for example, um, two very successful examples of formal and informal collaboration uh, is what's happened in Jordan with Generations for Peace organization. So Generations for Peace organization is an informal organization that collaborates with the Jordanian government and they deliver peace education programs inside formal schools. 
Uh, there have been some downsides of these projects. For example, they used to take students out of their classes. And that's why while we're developing like some piece related skills, they might fall behind their peers in the academic subjects that sometimes they might be taken out or at least arrive late to these classes. Uh, another very important example, I was really inspired by this study. It's happened by the non-formal organization in Afghanistan. It's called Help the Afghan Children Organization. So they collaborate with the formal sector. They deliver their programs before the classes, before uh, the school starts or after the school starts. And they have the community-based approach where they, reached, uh, they reach out to parents and to other members of society through radio platform, through involving some uh, women representative from the civil society. And the evaluation of their programs is really highly effective and successful. Uh, for peace making, peace building, uh, I mentioned, I think uh, this conceptualization is offered by Johan Galton, as I mentioned. And if you're interested in reading more, uh, I really recommend you get Hilary Kerman and Torrance Bevington book. It's a very interesting book that elaborate extensively on these three dimensions and how to incorporate them and apply them robustly in the context of formal schools. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great question. And thanks, Basma, for, for, for being available and answering the questions. And let me just do a little bit of a shout out to someone or an organization that Basma mentioned uh, for those that are interested. And thank you to Basma for this. Uh, we will have the overall president of the Generations for Peace um, talking in the Youth and Peace session later today. Um, so Generations for Peace are a leading Jordanian um, peace building organization, uh, voted number three in NGOs around the world uh, um, in terms of peace building out of all the NGOs around the world. And thanks to Basma, we have the president that will be talking with us later today, as well as other great speakers. Um, so I know we've got another seven more minutes left. Um, so one thing we can do is that we can continue talking. And I think this is a wonderful kind of peace education activity in and of itself because it's about inclusivity. So let's, let's do a bit of a poll here. What do you think, Donna, in terms of leaving it, in terms of going round and speaking, or we could share the screen and answer one of the questions that we were thinking of doing um, in breakouts, but we won't go into breakouts because I think it's a nice kind of intimate feel that we have here. You know, I feel part of a group. So what would you, what would you suggest, Donna and others? What do you think? Um, we could always share in the chat box screen or what was it, uh, sharing the screen or breakout question. Yeah. So we could write screen or question if we wanted. So, so, so yeah, so, okay. So one would be a breakout question and then the other one would be stay. So as in stay yeah. as we're continuing. So <laughs> breakout or stay, what do you want to do? You can write in the chat here. Stay, okay, so a bit of democracy in action here coming on. <laughs> okay, so stay, 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 break out, okay, okay. So it looks like if we're going the democracy, democratic kind of way, it seems to me, am I right? Happy to either, okay, Donna, you're kind of happy with either. So am I right in thinking that we'll stay? How does that sound to everybody? So we've got another kind of six more minutes. So should we keep going round then and uh, get some more voices in the room? So I don't know. Um, yeah, who would, who, who, so who spoke? So Basma, you were last, you, you spoke last. So would you like to invite someone maybe? I actually, I would like to ask something to Basma. Yes, about Maria, go ahead. Sure. If is that possible? Yeah, sure. absolutely. So I just wanted to ask something like in Colombia right now we have like the peace agreement that was signed in 2016 mm -hmm. and nowadays there is a great debate in, in the in the in the field of uh, education peace education why because after like 40 years of conflict uh, there is no like an agreement about how to tell the history to the next generations because mm -hmm. as you know after the conflict like, like the FARC and um, the government they want to tell the history in, in, the, in their own way. So the, he, the, nowadays there is a big big uh, debate about like how 
to address like the education nowadays and nothing has happened like in the school the formal schools like there is like our history about about our like country is just uh, until the, the the colonization but afterwards until you get to the university you got like a more uh, history about your country so nowadays that is a big field that does that they, they have a challenge of how to overcome it so I think that is happening the same in another like context too, where you want to work in formal education, but like uh, the political and interests doesn't allow like diversify uh, or put like into account the piece, like a, a general concept. So how you are overcoming or how would you address that kind of, of issues in the peace education, if that's understandable, I don't know if you understand. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much, Maria. I think you brought forward some of the most contentious issues in the field of peace education because whether we like it or not, peace education, especially when it comes to formal schools, it is politicized. And you mentioned the Colombian context. Honestly, I'm not like specialized in the Colombian context, but I can give you examples in Lebanon, for example, following the civil war, they completely stopped teaching history because there is no way that they agree on a, a specific narrative. So, in uh, this is what happened in the Lebanese context. I also, when you were talking, I remembered what happened in Rwanda, for example. It is, what happened in Rwanda is a very, I think, proof how difficult the situation is because the government imposed a national, uh, a national narrative where they literally try to, to remove any causes related to ethnic rivalries and just to blame the Belgian colonization to, to what happened. Uh, the matter is, absolutely very difficult when the government is involved and I think one way could be around this is really what we talked about the collaboration of formal and informal sector so if the civil society is strong and there is like a kind of legitimate collaboration between them I think there might be a possibility of putting some pressure on at least avoiding some narratives that might only increase the tension sometimes between people and really do things antithesis to peace uh, I'm not sure if Phil would like to add, uh, because I'm aware Phil worked in uh, context. Uh, I'm not sure, Phil, did you work in Colombia? Well, I've been, I've been a visiting professor, but uh -huh. I think probably the expert on Colombia is, 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 is the one that asked the question. So I, I, I'm <laughs> curious about how you might respond to the question you asked. No, is that I didn't want to ask, uh, like, um, all about Colombia is just like a kind of like an example of how challenging it is like a, to set a common ground for teach a, a peace in formal education. Like to give you like a, a background what is happening in my country, maybe what will happen like in in another countries where you would like to put like peace as a common, a common uh, concept. So maybe uh, that could affect I don't know that you, maybe you can take that um, into account in your investigation. Yeah, in an ideal world, there are these arguments for teaching contested narrative and intergroup contact and putting students with different perspectives together so that they learn about each other. And the theory behind this is that when you are uh, exposed to a different narrative, then this would lead to reducing the prejudice between. There are a lot of complexities with this approach and it has critiqued a lot, but I mean, in an idealized world, this what would happen is that we would teach contested narrative. But honestly, political will is a primary prerequisite for that. And here were the complexities. And one, one times I remember I was struggling with this question and I ended up uh, that if we would like to study this, we'd like to answer the question, to what extent is individual agency effective in the face of structural uh, asymmetry in the country? And according to that, we kind of develop what kind of programs to be delivered in this specific context. So in a context, for example, where there is no way we introduce contested narrative, then maybe like try to focus these education programs on other elements that we are able to tackle. And these elements could be like sometimes not even politicized. Like uh, there is one of the participants mentioned the importance of really just like developing the listening skills of uh, the communication skills, how to accept the perspective of the other, not necessarily in direct relation to the conflict that happened in the past. Of course, there is a need to, uh, to address the trauma and everything that happened. And if it's not possible through the formal sector, then maybe we try to find our ways through the non-formal sectors. 
Thank you, Baz. So I'm aware, thank you. So I'm aware of the time. I want to respect everybody. So let me just come back on to two things there. Um, I think what Basma and what all the questions revolve around is, is a question which is perhaps at the core of, you know, teaching contested concepts or, or peace education or education more broadly is, is this question. And I will touch on it in part two. Uh, for those that are interested, is this question, whose knowledge is, most, is of most worth and who decides? And who benefits and who doesn't? So how do we go about making those decisions is one of the questions. On the lines of um, Columbia and history and contested concepts and things like this, Julia Paulson from the University of Bristol has done some work on that. So you might want to check out her. Um, another thing I think we've seen in terms of reflection, bringing it to the end, and we want to say thank you so much for joining us. It was a nice kind of intimate feeling um, is... Um, we, we haven't come away with this with answers. We've come away with this with asking more questions. And one of the things I often do, whether I'm teaching, whether at university or young people or whatever is, is that I, I sometimes say something like, by the way, when you finish this class, you will be finishing this class with not answers. You know, we have done our job. If you walk away from this class, asking more questions, because through asking more questions, you can then develop an, um, a deeper idea of the understanding. With a deeper understanding, you can then decide how to act and make informed decisions. And I think we've seen a bit of this. So thank you to everybody for joining us. What's left for us to do now is to say, part two, we'll be looking at, well, okay, we've looked at the theory and the and a discussion of practice, but how do we physically go about developing a peace education project in practice? What are some of the questions that we need to ask? And that's what we're gonna be looking at in 15 minutes. So thanks again, Basma, Amar, for wonderful, wonderful, wonderful speeches. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you much to you for wonderful questions and wonderful contributions. And Basma, Amar, if you want to, if you haven't done already, please share your email for people to reach out to you because yes, absolutely. you some really interesting things. So I, I, before closing down um, the session, I'll give like a minute or so for you to write in, if you haven't done it already, your email. And thank yes. you, everybody. Thank for you for having me, Phil. And Good to see everyone. I just uh, typed in my email. Please feel free to reach out to me if I can be of any help or if you would like to provide any insights on my project. I would like to say again that it's not published yet. I would really appreciate any feedback or insights that can be integrated before it's finalized and published. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. See you shortly. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.